So, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Brandon Gadsen. Um I share a little bit about myself. I was born in Louisiana. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. I moved to Atlanta when I was five. So, um, I'm what they call an ATL. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, was, I was born in Atlanta. Um, played ball. Uh, my senior year, I had the privilege of being ranked top 20 in the Peace Street Athletic Club in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, from there, I received a scholarship to go to West Virginia, where I was there for a year, and I went to junior college, did a little, little traveling around, went to junior college after that. After that, I went down to the Kenny Smith basketball camp in UNC in North Carolina, met Kenny Smith. We became pretty good friends. He became a mentor to me. He actually encouraged me to come play at Kentucky State University, where his friend was coaching. And so, um, I did that, came here to play ball. Um, after my time of playing ball here, I went to go play pro ball in Chicago. Where I had the privilege to work under um, a legend, Tim Grover. Tim Grover is a trainer for Michael Jordan, um, for Dwayne Wade, Kobe Bryant, Serena Williams, Derek Jeter, um, Joaquin Noah, and so many other people. He's just like phenomenal. Um, truly a, a guru of development and training and all that great stuff. Um, he helped me get my first agent. My agent after that got me my first opportunity to play professional basketball. I played pro ball there and discovered that there was another passion in me that basketball wasn't fulfilling. So um, I left there, came back to college, got my degree, and I started working uh, for Kentucky State University. My first job there was an academic coach where we partnered and worked with leadership and training development for models for students in the high schools in Jefferson County. And then uh, took another job with KSU right after that as the program coordinator for HIV prevention and substance abuse at Kentucky State University. And so um, September 31st, I started my own business and started to do some things that I enjoy. Since then, I've been traveling, doing leadership development and training. I just got back from Amsterdam. It was awesome. We was there for five days. The training was for three. Uh, when I leave here at 6 o'clock, I'll be catching a flight to Illinois to do some more development. I'm saying I love to say that I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I love I, I get excited to see people come into what they're called to come into. So this is a treat for me. I'm actually honored really to be here to meet you amazing people. I know you guys are doing a great job here and I just wanted to share my little portion of what I can offer and hope that it can help inspire you and you can pass it. Oh we good? So this is a really small group so I think we can really do good with names. So can we just kind of go across here? My name is Dane Blackburn. Okay. I work in Nice. Joey Puckett, I work in the building. Awesome. Brian Engel, I work in the building. Yes. Sam Drake, I work up here in the second floor. Awesome. Oh, Jay, let's move here. Fifth floor. Awesome. Little Holmes, I work on the fourth floor. Okay. Another Jeff Chasper, I work with the University of Kentucky. Absolutely awesome. We were just talking about your wonderful institution, the sports program. Um, so, this session we're going to be talking about uh, a couple of different things. Our last session was good. It, it kind of opened up into some things, and I like for things to happen like they are now. And so we're going to seek for the same thing today. Um, but the nature of this course, we want to talk about leadership development. So I do not like to make assumptions, so I want to ask you to define for me leadership. You hear the term leadership. What comes to mind? How would you define leadership? Please don't all speak at once. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that comes to mind is like being a good example for right. others. Yeah. Good example for others. Yes, that's the first thing. First thing. Awesome. Or what would you say? Um, for another for yourself. Mm -hmm. To know you for yourself. That's awesome. How about you? Right. A vision coupled with passion. Vision coupled with passion. Okay. How about you, sir? The whole plastic of stuff. Okay. Ultimately, I guess leadership comes down to influence. Comes down to influence. That's good. How much? <coughs> um, lead by example and then listen. Absolutely. How about you, sir? Helping others make a difference. Helping others make a difference. How about you, sir? Uh, I'll say key leadership because I'm agreeing with everyone. The key leadership to me is is setting direction. Someone has to say, okay, what are we trying to do? That's the direction. Awesome. I'm in total agreement with all the things that you said. I think leadership comes down to 
one chief cornerstone, which would be serving other people. Like we talked about. How can I um, inspire, motivate, bring out the purpose in people's lives? You know, leadership is a it's a uh, it's a very interesting thing because everyone is called to be leaders. No one was created to be a follower. Everyone was called to lead. And you're called to lead in your sphere of influence. You're called to lead maybe in your home. You're called to lead maybe in a, you know, in a class that you take, in your church, whatever it is. But in our lives, we're all called to be leaders. We're all born with the leadership spirit. But we have to learn how to become leaders. So although the potential in all of our lives is to be leaders, we still have to learn how to become leaders. It's like a seed. Isn't an apple seed an apple tree? Yeah. Inside of the tree, we have orchards. But this seed still has to become what it's created to be, which is an apple tree. So trapped in that seed is an apple tree. And trapped in every single person in the room is a leader. We just got to figure out the process and develop it into what it is that we're created to be. That's the purpose of leadership. Good leaders develop you into who you're called to be. They know how to make the seed begin to break and put it in the soil and how to cultivate it and bring out the best you. So leadership is never... You, you're not called to lead people. I know this may seem untraditional to some. But you're never called to lead people. You're called to lead, lead in the area of gifting. Your gifting brings influence and that influence makes you lead. So the thing that draws people to you is your gift. Your gift is what makes people recruit you. It, it makes you, it, 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 not that your worth or your value comes from your gift, but people tend to identify your worth and your value by your gift. So you find a person that's really gifted at constructing buildings and being able to draw out what you're thinking. We call them architects. We find these gifted individuals that's able to give a layout of what you're thinking. And we're willing to pay them whatever they're charging us according to their level of gifting. How well do you do this? How good are you at this? See, when you know, when, when you have a reputation that you're really great at something, you can then demand your own price. Because you've developed yourself, you've developed your gifting to the point where you understand the value and the worth of it, and people are willing to pay you because of your gifting. So your gift is your leadership fruit. Apples and oranges don't come to you. We're drawn to the tree because of the fruit that's on the tree. So when people can see that, it draws it to you. The only issue with people only being known by their gifting that if their character is bad, they'll overlook your gifts. In most cases. If the people that you're working for, if the, if the company that you're going, if they have other gifted people, and they have a real value of people, then they, they'll maybe be patient with you for a moment, for you know, because you have other leaders that say, hey, I see this in you, I want to have develop you. But if you become about yourself, then you won't last long, because you have a lack of character. So character and the gift are both equally valued. They should be. So as a leader, I can't just discover my gift. I have to develop my character. And crisis, life, and all those things are opportunity for me to develop my character. So when it comes to leadership, when it comes to being a leader, the first thing that me personally, that I have to understand and know that first of all, leadership is not about me. The moment I live my life for myself and I become ambitious, I'm no longer a leader. I am a dictator. I will not motivate you. I will manipulate you. If I'm living for myself 
And I'm not living to serve you. That's where you give the term ambitious. You're being motivated by something you can gain for yourself. Maybe finances, maybe a better life, maybe a home or a family, whatever it is, it has nothing to do with society. It has everything to do with you and your motive and what you can get out of life. We tend to call those people selfish. When you have people that are living for themselves and that, that uses their power, their influence at work to make them feel better about themselves, or now they can walk in the office because they have this fancy position, those are not leaders. Those are insecure people that have an opportunity to work in these roles and they're leaking, they're bleeding. And the way they bleed is, they feel challenged by you when you show up because of your level of intellect, because you've discovered your gifting, because of your character, you become a threat to them. So they begin to dictate things. They begin to make sure they do things to keep you at bay because you're a threat now, because they have no character. So they become dictators and they manipulate. They can never motivate you and inspire you. So we're not here to be dictators. Nor are we here to be manipulative. We're here to be leaders. And the best way that we can do that is when we, someone said it, put others before ourselves. That's the heart of leadership. That's why we have, you know, when we look at history and we look at these leaders that, that, that come before us. We talked about some of them before um, in the last session. We look at George Washington. We look at uh, Reverend Martin Luther King. We look at all the different leaders. The ones that we still talk about today in a healthy way of those that put others before themselves. They were willing to sacrifice. They were so motivated by purpose and it built a conviction in them to the point they were willing to die for what they believed. They lost the fear of man in a conviction. They didn't have to recruit people. People wanted to follow them. Because they seen something worth following, which is a man driven by purpose, with conviction. See, leaders burn with conviction and they make you contagious. All of a sudden, you now have a conviction that you didn't have before. There are things that we have no conviction of that once you encounter a leader, you begin to burn with their same heart. I want to see equality too. I want to see people helped as well. And now they become contagious in a good way. They start to reproduce themselves. And that's the goal of leadership. Leaders are designed to bring out the leaders in you. That comes from passion, that leads to a conviction, that leads to passion outside purpose, that leads to conviction, that produce passion, and then all of a sudden we're motivated. We're living our lives every day. You wake up every day out of your bed knowing that you have a reason why you're on the planet. You're always motivated. Sometimes you sleep late. Why? You're doing things in line with your purpose. Honey, I have to get this done. I have to do this. I have, why? You're being motivated. You're inspired by this change you know that's needed. And that's what leaders do. They live with this conviction. And they'll die for their conviction. You lose the fear of man once purpose consumes you. And that's what we all want. To the point where no one can rob you of your conviction. They can either join, keep it moving. So we talk about developing leaders. It's bigger than just your leadership role here for this cabin. It's, it's, it's the essence of who you're called to be in your sphere of influence. So, in order for us to be really effective and successful in that, we have to discover this. Purpose. Purpose is decided or described as original intent. Purpose is a person that sees their end from the beginning and then they spend their life getting there. Purpose is predestination. You know your destination and you're working to get there. Purpose is your it's 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 like vision. You you get this vision and with this vision you begin to pursue it because you understand the need of your life that you're called to be here on the planet, you're needed for a specific purpose. There's no person that's born that does not have purpose. That's why suicide is such a sad thing. 
because everyone has a purpose. They lose sight of that in all of the life challenges and they reduce themselves down to what they're going through. And they miss purpose. That's why purpose is so important because purpose gives you the motivation to grow, go through what you're going through. What keeps you going when life just goes crazy? What keeps you up studying at night when you know you have, you know, you, you, you want to get to sleep but you have finals tomorrow? And what keeps you going? Purpose. I know I have to pass this class. Why? Because I still see myself being a lawyer or a doctor. I have to give myself to this. By default, it begins to bring out the best in us. But some people, you know, they go through adversities, trials, tribulations, all these kind of things. And they cut purpose short for something that's seasonal. They make a permanent decision in something that's seasonal. And we can't do it. So we have to embrace all those things. But the thing that gets us, keeps us going, the thing that motivates us is purpose. I told you guys when you first came in, I played basketball. I also played drums. I, I did acting when I was younger. Um, um, man, I had an opportunity to kind of dive into different walks of life. But what I was sharing earlier was... It was interesting, 20 years of basketball, and all of a sudden my life shifts. I no longer want to be a professional basketball player. I want to go a whole different way. If I knew during my time of pursuing basketball, if I knew then my purpose, then during those 20 years, I would have invested more time in my purpose and not just my talent. There are people in this room, you're very talented. A lot of different talents. So like I said, I played drums, I did acting, I did all these different things. But drums, acting, and out in basketball wasn't the destination, it wasn't the purpose. So what wisdom does, wisdom draws a line down the middle of the table and it allows you to identify talents as tools to get you to your purpose. But some people discover that they're talented and pursue their area of talent as if that's their purpose. So what if, what if Michael Jordan was never called to be a basketball player? He was just talented in it. And he pursued it and developed his talent. You know, Denzel Washington said something that was interesting. He said, uh, I'm an actor, but I know what I'm called to do, and I'm running for my calling. You know what Denzel said he's called to do? He said he's called to be a preacher. He says, I don't want to do it, so I run from it. That's why I've just been acting the last, what, 30 years. That's what he said. Why? The danger of talent is that you can be consumed by it and miss purpose. Is this job the place, the destination? It may be for some. Is it a stepping song? Are you doing something that you're talented at? Are you in purpose? Is this talent getting you to the purpose? Is this the end? If not, then that's fine. This is a place we can look at it as, um, you know, somewhere that's getting us to where we need to go. But we have to identify purpose and stay driven by it. Why? Because it's the original intent. It's the reason why you're placed on the planet. And that's what we have to discover. So my question to you, well, I'll ask the same question. I need to know some of your talents. What are some of the things that you do that you have the capacity to do that you might have done when you were younger, when you was in high school, or that you do away from work? Just some talents that you have. I'll start on this end since I started the last time. What's some talents that you have, sir? I used to race motocross. used to race motocross. Motocross. Why? Wow. How about you, Brian? Um, I think my talent is probably just uh, public speaking, interacting. Public speaking and interacting. How about you, sir? Uh, I'm an engineer, which hopefully is talent. I'm not sure. I'm uh, very good at being involved. Uh, <laughs> but no, I like public speaking. So I like, I like to, to merge engineering and public speaking. Wow. That's awesome. How about you, sir? I really like to listen to people tell what drives them and where they're from and their history. Wow. Wow. I don't know. It is the ability to observe and 
learn as a sponge. <laughs> yes, I'm an engineer too, so I think that's a talent, right? And then yes. gardening. Gardening? Oh, awesome. Absolutely. Yes, sir. I'd say I do a lot of work with young people, love agriculture. Absolutely. Leadership is the great for us, right? Okay. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm like really that funny of a guy, but I have a way of making at least like my family laugh. And when, you know, a good laugh is needed, I feel like that's good. Absolutely. Okay, so my second question would be how are you or how were you able to make a distinction of not pursuing your talent? as a profession and choosing what you're choosing now. If it doesn't end up meaning. So for instance, if I, I could re-ask the question in a better, in better light, but like I explained earlier, I was going out to basketball and discovered that even though I was talented at basketball, it wasn't purpose. So how are you able to make the distinction between this versus that? Can I have one brave individual take that question? I didn't like broken bones. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't like broken bones. Okay. 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 Well, that doesn't apply to my answer specifically, but I think that what uh, really, if you do something that instead of you know what your talent or your passion is, is because you just need it to be like a safer route. Mm. Or it's, you know, uh, maybe go a little, yeah, be safer than maybe what. That is very, very interesting. Did you hear that one? That it may be safer to pursue a talent because you're good at it versus the thing that you're actually called to do. Because when I was growing up, I was known as Brandon, the basketball player, and I found my identity through what I was doing. And now I'm pursuing basketball because I'm good at it, but it had nothing to do with what I would consider my purpose is. But it's easy to get trapped up in doing it because it's safer because you've already established yourself. You already have influence, kind of. you have people recruiting, you have all these different things. So what I hear from you is that even in pursuing your purpose, there are gonna be some sacrifices and there's gonna be a place of you having to be maybe even uncomfortable in pursuing your purpose. Stepping out of what you may call what's normal and then going after what you and I have this conviction, this desire to pursue. I think that was really, I thought that was really awesome. What about you, Brian? How would you able to make the distinction? I think I kind of stumbled on mine, uh, mm -hmm. kind of not, not stumbled into it, uh, but just over time, you know, given opportunities to, to do what I love anyway, and then having an opportunity to work in that. So for me, even from college, I think I knew, or what, you know, well, for middle school, I knew what my purpose was going to be, and I don't know that I really ever had any other talents. <laughs> I mean, maybe I did, but I never ended up discovering any of those uh, or, or pursuing many of those. I mean, I loved to play sports and things like that, but always undersized and, and just smaller than everybody else. Mm -hmm. and just as, well, at least even, even, you know, some of their feedback was just as talented, but just didn't have the look. And so I, I just never really pursued those things. And, uh, then, you know, just ended up getting to do what I love to do anyway. So for me, it was really just a divine connection that allowed me to enjoy my talent and fulfill my purpose. So I, I think that it's, I found a nice place. That's awesome. That's good fun. That's awesome. What about somebody from the back table? This is a very deep subject. I don't know if I can even say it five minutes and those in the room that know me. I'm loud laughing. Uh, Sorry. Uh, um, so I have to always start, and everybody knows, but I'm a devout Christian, so I draw a lot of my principles and thoughts of life on, on Scripture. And so Scripture says that God gifted us. He gifted all of us, and our gifts will make a way for us. So I believe in that wholeheartedly. So I think that, you know, the little boy that I was, sorry to tear up. That's not shocking me, either, is it, Brian? Tear up. Um, the little boy that was really good at math and science, that had a dad who was an engineer, that thought, I think I'm going to do that. Um, those were the gifts that I believe God gave me. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
as I went to college and, and turned those talents that he gave me into a profession, um, I believe that part of my purpose uh, in this life is to make my workplace my worship place. Mm -hmm. So uh, I ended up getting into the transportation community and being in highways. Mm -hmm. And I reflect that worship of what I'm good at back to God. Because the ultimate purpose in my life mm -hmm. is the faith based is to glorify God. So, um, that's about as short I can make. <laughs> that was good. That was awesome. That was, that was awesome. Now, I'm sorry. What's your name again? My name is Jeff. Or Bob Jeff. God, whatever we want to call it. <laughs> Jeff. So, here's what I, I'm, I'm already. You see this. You see Jeff as an example. You see this. Right? You see this. You see this. Just from what he just said to you. Your purpose, by default, reads a conviction. My conviction is I'm called to make my workplace. And then from that he's passionate, crying, tears. See, what we can't do, because he's so convicted, we can't rob him of that. We can challenge that, but we can't take that from him. I can join him in this conviction. I can identify with his purpose and say, really? Wow. But you see an example. We all have to first identify this. Because then everything else, as we pursue this, everything else will follow. I personally believe that you can be alive but dead. The moment you stop dreaming, the moment you stop living by the purpose, and you're just doing life, you're working to get by, you, you know, it all becomes about the zeros on your check, and just, you know, have a nice house, a family, and all those things, and you don't have any kind of purpose with life, you're going through life and not really pursuing purpose in life, then it's really not life. You're just going through the motions. I've learned I can go through the motions on these, especially when you've done it so much, you can just do it. There's no, there's no purpose in this. I'm just, I could just do this as much as I want. It has no significance. I can learn something and just go through the motions. Or you can do something with intentions and passion, and it changes everything when you do it. it comes from a different place. It's inspired and motivated from a different place. It's more intentional. And that's what we have to be. If we made this session about purpose and we were talking about how to discover your purpose, here's the first thing I would tell you. Purpose, when you talk about purpose, it's always about other people. You are not created for yourself. So when you're trying to identify purpose, it's going to always be for other people. People tend to discover their purpose in vision. What do you see? If that, if that vision is you see you driving this nice car, pulling up in this six-bedroom uh, home, and that's not purpose, that's ambition. Purpose always involves other people and how we can serve other people. That's the thing that we have to discover. Are there any questions thus far about purpose? Okay. So, you know, I love this word conviction. Conviction is, you know, there's different ways you can define the word conviction, you know, we can, um, but I think the way I would like to, or the definition I would choose in this particular situation is, I would actually give you this, a scenario. Let's say, let's say for instance, 
man, can I just continue to use you, Jeff? Absolutely. Okay. Let's say, so Jeff says he had this, this divine moment with God, right? And God says something to Jeff. He has a vision. Or he's in his room and an angel or something shows up to Jeff, right? And Jeff, in this moment, is so surreal to him. He lost track of time. It's so divine to him. It's just him and his creator. He speaks to Jeff. And then all of a sudden, the room, it goes from all white back to normal. And he's in the same position that he was in. He's like just so overwhelmed by this experience. This experience inserted something in his heart where now he's, he's enlightened. He's inspired. He's like, oh my goodness. People need to know about this. People need to know what just happened to me. So he goes out and now he's telling people, but the reason why he's telling people by this thing that was inserted, that thing that's inserted, we call it conviction, is where you have something burning in your heart and by any means necessary, it's causing a response out of you. People don't live with conviction. People live in comfort. That's not okay. Conviction is a part of life. It's a result of something. And in purpose, it's a result of discovering why you are on the planet. Once you have that encounter with purpose, we don't have to try to give you conviction. It's inserted in the moment you encounter purpose. Now you have this conviction. Now you see people that are willing to die for their conviction. We call them heroes. That's why we love Superman. That's why we love Batman. They're out saving the world, fighting evil. And I, I remember, I, I've seen people cry watching superhero movies. They see Wolverine die and they just cry. The last one, oh, Wolverine's gone. Look, see, look, he's right there. Superman finally dies after 16 times of dying and not really dying. But when a person that was driven by such purpose and com compassion and conviction passed, we're like, wow, that's crazy. That's, man, oh, he passed away? Wow. It impacts us. Why? Because their life impacted us. And it was based on the conviction that they lived with. So we're talking about motivation. And motivation is a result of those things. Being motivated. Now, here's the thing. So you're here, you're working at, a, at the Transportation Academy. It's easy to just turn this thing into a job. Now, listen, people that don't live by purpose or don't have a pursuit will turn this just into a job. They won't see it as either the place I need to be or a stepping stone. So you're just coming to work. And you treat people like that. Well, no. You can tell when people are actually on a way somewhere. They carry themselves. You, they, they, there's, there's this aura that people give off when they're driven by something. And if I know that me coming to work here and me being under Brian is giving me to my purpose, it's going to dictate even how I treat him. Why? Because he's in my life to help me get me to my purpose. Think about this. Why would a company have a leadership development for their workers? It says something about the head. We want to promote leaders. So bring leaders in to help create more leaders. So you know just that kind of mentality says that this is a healthy place, but we have to get, you have to get what it is you're called to get while you're here. You have to become what you're called to be while you're here. You can't just do life or do work. Not when you have purpose. Even if this job is designed to fund your purpose, even if you're doing what Albert Einstein did, can you tell me what Albert Einstein, a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, in his year, or when he was younger, before he became famous, he was a mail clerk in Switzerland. So he was doing this mundane job while simultaneously still pursuing his math. Why? And his research. So he was doing this job while he was pursuing the other job. It was a door, it was a gate, it was an opportunity 
leading him into what he felt like he was called to do. And that's what everything is getting us to that destination. And that's what it's, that's ultimately what it's about, that place. Now, we use this as an example. I'm just going to continue right because I thought it was good. Um, so let's say we're on the way to the University of Louisville. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Yes, sir. Have a blessed day now. Thank you. Let's say we're on the way to the University of Louisville. And um, that's, my, that's my destination. That's where I'm called to be. And I have to go visit um, the financial aid department. Okay, so I get in the car and I'm on the way there. On the way there, I discover, well, I have my family in the car. And I got my, let's say I have a son. I don't have any children right now. But let's say I have a son in the back seat. He's like throwing up and oh man, oh man, he gets so sick. So now we have to stop, change his diapers, we did all these things. And he's just, I mean, his dad is coming out of both hands. So we now have to detour and take him to the hospital. We get to the hospital, and now the doctors are working on him. They want to run a test on him, doing all these things. Keep in mind, my destiny, my destination is University of Louisville. But I have this situation happen. Now, of course, it's not it's uncomfortable in the car, your child is going through these things, you got to do all these things. It's, it's not a part of the plan. What do we call that? We call it a crisis an issue, that's a definition in the word we call change. The key in life is actually knowing how to manage change. Because change is coming to all of us. You may go home today and things have changed. You may get a call from a loved one and things have changed. You may come to work tomorrow and things have changed. Look in the mirror, things have changed. Look at some pictures from high school, things have changed. The one thing that's coming to every one of us is change. So the best thing that we can do is invest in our lives and figure out how to manage change. Because if we can do that, then we can be successful in any kind of changing environment, circumstances, situation in our life. So I have a question for you. Why don't people like change? Get them out of their comfort zone. Get them out of their comfort zone. What do you got for me, sir? Something that makes you uncomfortable. You don't know what to expect. You don't know what to expect. Yes. What about you? I was going to say the same thing. Uh huh. You don't uh -huh. know what to expect. You don't know what to expect. Yes. How about you, Brian? Messes with your routine. Messes with your routine. How about you, sir? The definition of stress has changed. The definition of stress has changed. That's good. A lot of stress has changed. I can correlate. Yes, sir. It breaks what you think the future is, and until they map out that. It's all of the things that everybody's got. Mm -hmm. It's risk averted. Absolutely. That's good. Now I'm going to ask you another question. Why do people like change? New start. New start. Fresh start. Hold it. I don't really like change. You don't really like change. I don't really like change. Right. <laughs> How about you, Brian? Well, it can't do a It can be a catalyst for a contract. Push you closer toward where you're trying to get. Catalyst, yeah. absolutely. Push you where you're trying to go. How about you, sir? You said hope. Hope. How about you, sir? Yeah, just getting you where you want to be. Getting you where you want to be. Hey, if I make $50,000 and I'm getting ready to get a promotion to $2,000, what, $200,000 a year, I'm going to like that change. Especially if my living situation was tough and I have a family at home. That's a good change. But I'm replacing someone. It's a bad change for him. So people engage change differently. What could be your success could be someone else's failure. But we still don't need to know how to manage it. So you have two types of change, proactive and reactive. 
proactive change and reactive change. You have a change that you can actually control, and then there's a change that's out of your control. Um, we use the term, oh, it's 12.02. Here's a change. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, a couple, a few more minutes here. Okay, okay. We're the only ones that will be affected by it. Oh, okay. Everybody else will be the only one. What, what do we call the different weather patterns in, in a duration of time, a large duration of time? I can't argue with those. Okay. It begins with an S. Seasons. Seasons. Seasons, <laughs> Seasons is when something changes. So we all have seasons in our lives. So what if it's snowing outside? And I don't want this to change. I like the summer. And I go outside with my shorts on and my hat and my t-shirt on and say, listen, I don't care how much you snow. I'm wearing my summer stuff. What is that snow going to do to me? It's going to snow anyway, so it's going to be back inside. I get sick, I end up at the hospital. Why? I am trying to change something that's not going to change. The best thing I could do is learn how to adapt to the change. For reactive change, the first thing you have to do is adapt. People don't like adapting, like my friend says, because it's uncomfortable. We've been doing this for 20 years. Why change now? It's a change of seasons. It's a change of leadership. So now we have to adapt. So we always have to be adaptable because we all know change is coming. Change just in the technology arena of life. Like last 20 years we went from flip phones to smartphones. So I guess the other ones one is smart. So now we have tablets. But that's a major change for people that are, what, Generation X? I'm sorry. My grandmother is struggling with this change. Either she can adapt or be affected by it and try to define the snow, but it's going to keep snowing. So what I have to do is resharpen my skills. I may have to go back to school and get a certification in something. I may have to go back and get my degree. I may have to sit under someone that can educate me and teach me about the change that's coming. So that I can adapt. So the first thing is adapting. Once you adapt to it, you begin to accommodate change. Okay, this snow is not going nowhere. I still have my hand outside, it's snowing. Okay, here's what I need to do. I need to now begin to, I, I accept it, now I begin to accommodate it. I give me a coat, I give me some boots, I give me a scarf, now I'm accommodating the change. I'm actually working with it now. Once I begin to work with it, then I begin to manage it. I get, uh, clear off my driveway, I get up early, clear it off so my wife can pull out of the driveway and she can leave and have her, you know, be able to get to work. Now we do cocoa or, you know, we roast some marshmallows inside. Now I'm making the best of change. I'm actually managing it. That's how you respond to reactive change, change you cannot control. But then there's another type of change, proactive, that you actually dictate. So there's a young man right now, a young woman, working on the next iPhone. And they actually say it's going to come out 2017 in June. What are they doing? They're saying, time, you're not going to control us. We're going to control time by planning. Planning allows you to dictate change. Now, you're taking control of time and say, hey, at 2 o'clock, this is what we're going to do. At 3 o'clock, I'm going to be doing this. At 4 o'clock, I'm going to do this. And on next week, at 6 o'clock this time, I'm having this conference. I'm having this. You're actually now controlling what happens in time. 
So we can be proactive about things and actually do that through planning, or we can be reactive and live moment to moment not knowing what's going to happen. This meeting was planned months before. So all we're doing right now is following what they plan. To him, the outcome of everything working in conjunction is either a successful plan or an unsuccessful plan. But he's able to gauge it when he looks back at his plans. So I'm still trying to get to Louisville. My child is at the hospital. I've had a change. Boy, what, what, what do I do now? I just adapt to it. Now I get there and I work in conjunction with the doctors. What do we need to do? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, cool. Now I'm back in my car on the way to my same destination. The change did not stop me from getting to my purpose. The adversity does not stop me from getting to my purpose. The crisis does not stop me. But what I have to learn in that critical moment is character development. Because I don't want to be at the doctor while my child is sick and, oh, come on, man, doctor, this is all you can do, and blah, blah, blah. And now I'm showing I have a lack of character. So there I need to learn how to calm down. I need to learn how to gather myself. I need to learn how to be patient. I need to have hope. I need to learn all these things in that moment. And that's what issues also do. They don't just bring change. They also perfect us. See, we don't know what you're made of until we give you six or seven projects that you say you can't do. How do you respond to that? How do you respond to the heat or the pressure? A lot of people talk about what they believe, but you will never see it until they get under pressure. When pressure comes, you can see what they really believe. So all these things are developing who we are, what we believe, in line of getting to our destination, our purpose. All these things happen. But it doesn't matter. We learn how to deal with change along the way. We learn how to adapt. We learn how to accommodate. We learn how to manage. And we still get to where we need to go. And we just pick up tools of development, of perspective, and all these things on the way to our destination. And when we get there, you get to tell me about your journey and how you got there. And you get to encourage me as I go to my destination. Now you get to redevelop or rebuild or reproduce in me all the leadership qualities you develop, all the things you've gotten along the way. And now you may be save me also from getting up on some bad exits. Or I might need to get some people out of my car that can't go with me to this destination. So thank you so much for your time. Go get some good lunch. I appreciate you guys. Have a great day.